to this very special webinar on tobacco industry interference in public health as well as tobacco industry's efforts to undermine the Global Tobacco Treaty, which is formally, formally called the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control or WHO FCTC. Since almost 19 years, CNS team members have been part of the Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals or NAT, as it is more commonly known, known as, hosted by Corporate Accountability, which was earlier called in fact. Corporate Accountability and NAT has worked dedicatedly to protect the Global Tobacco Treaty and its implementation from tobacco industry interference. Even the World Health Organization recognizes how tobacco industry interference thwarts public health. Our governments have adopted the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs at last year's UN General Assembly, one of which is to effectively implement FCTC. We will fail to meet the SDGs if we let the tobacco industry delay, dilute, or defeat, or even derail the progress on implementation of FCTC. Our first World No Tobacco Day webinar, held last Tuesday, focused on heart disease and tobacco with senior cardiologist and heart disease researcher, Professor Dr. Rishi Sethi, and the president of African Heart Network, Professor Dr. Pamela Naidu, as panelists. The recordings and podcasts are online at www.bit.ly slash WNDT2018. Both these webinars in the lead up to this year's World No Tobacco Day are more special because we are taking a moment to remember, feel, inspired, and celebrate the indomitable spirit and passion of a fearless and bold tobacco control leader, Yul Francisco Dorado. Yul was the Latin America Director of Corporate Accountability and a leader with Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals from Colombia. Perhaps one of the most inspired by Yul is Patty Lynn, who is the Executive Director of Corporate Accountability and a friend and mentor for so many of us. She is definitely one of those who is keeping the legacy of Yule alive, vibrant and fierce, and striving hard for a better world. Patty Lynn humbly dedicated these World No Tobacco Day webinar series to celebrate Yule's courage over the years in challenging injustices. Before we hear from our panelists today on the conflict between the interests of tobacco industry and interests of public health, it would be worthwhile to be reminded of the grave threat that tobacco use poses to human health. Keeping in mind the thematic focus of this year's World No, to World no Tobacco Day, which is tobacco and heart disease, I would request senior cardiologist and heart disease researcher, Professor Dr. Rishi Sethi, to share with us briefly the disease and death burden associated with tobacco use. Over to you, Professor Sethi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to uh, to speak a little bit about uh, the overall impact of tobacco and smoking on the cardiovascular health, because cardiovascular disease is the focus of attention in this year's WHO team for No Tobacco Day 2018. And it is very pertinent and very relevant that uh, WHO has chosen this theme because most of the mortality and most of the death from tobacco and smoking related disorder is happening uh, from cardiovascular disease. So going with the basic statistics, can I have the next slide please? Can I have the next slide? Yeah. Going by the statistics of India, every week around 13,000 Indian males above the age of 15 are dying from cardiovascular, uh, uh, are dying from tobacco-related diseases, and and this accounts for um, this accounts for. I mean, this is because of nearly 20 percent, nearly 20.4 percent of all adult Indian moles are tobacco consumption, and the total of in the percentage form the total number of uh, deaths that can be attributed to tobacco-related diseases around 13% of all 
mortality of India can be related to tobacco related diseases. This is the data from 2016. Can I have the next slide please? Now coming to the statistics of India, I mean all deaths um, related to so cardiovascular diseases both according to the WHO predictions and according to the Indian data, uh, most of the global mortality will happen from cardiovascular diseases that includes ischemic heart disease, heart attacks and stroke and when I mean, uh, and tobacco is one of the important uh, modifiable risk factors for this kind of disease. So if you focus the attention of uh, smoking and tobacco related diseases with specific reference to cardiovascular disease and we see its overall impact, any change in the smoking and tobacco consumption pattern will have effect on cardiovascular diseases and ultimately will have a much larger effect on global and um, Southeast Asian mortality um, per se. Next slide, please. So uh, how does the tobacco affect cardiovascular system? The, uh, the tobacco related diseases affect, uh, the tobacco affects cardiovascular physiology in various ways. It can activate clotting mechanisms and it can cause to inflammation of blood vessels, which lead to coronary heart disease, leading to heart attacks and angina, myocardial infarctions and angina. It can uh, relate to tobacco consumption can mean an increase in blood pressure, which again uh, implies the peripheral vascular diseases, cardiovascular diseases, renal diseases, stroke, everything rises by the rise of blood pressure. It can cause insulin resistant, blood clot abnormalities, higher catecholamines level, all can give rise to tobacco or all can give rise to an adverse cardiovascular health and it can also cause disturbance in the structure of the vessels when it occurs in the larger vessels it can it can weaken the muscular wall and can cause aneurysms of iota next slide please and if we see this is something that we have been seeing um, in our own patients, uh, this is on the left hand panel, this is the right coronary artery, on the left hand panel is a smooth looking tubular normal right coronary artery, but on your right sided panel there is a right coronary artery which is hugely ectatic and narrowed and dilated at certain portions. When this happens, uh, when this happens the normal pulsatile flow of blood inside coronary arteries is impeded because this artery is very ectatic and it has got um, a weakening of its muscular bed and this forms of artery, the ectatic coronary arteries gives rise to acute coronary syndromes and heart attack because there is sluggish blood flow here and sluggish blood flow leads to more clotting. And specifically, um, you know, as I've mentioned earlier in my previous talks, specifically this form of ectatic coronary arteries we are seeing in patients who have oral tobacco consumption and we have a series of 170 patients where we have proved that oral tobacco consumptions without any other cardiovascular risk factors was leading to acute coronary syndrome and this kinds of these kinds of ectatic coronary arteries. So this is some, one area of future research for oral tobacco consumption. We have also published a paper, next slide please, way back in 2008. We were seeing a lot of patients of who were younger in age and who were belonging to the low socioeconomic class, but generally when coronary artery disease first came into focus in the Western world in the early 50s and 60s, it was generally a disease of the rich of the affluent and people related to more dietary um, kind of overconsumptions and things like that. But nowadays we are seeing a lot of lower socioeconomic class people, a lot of younger people who do not have conventional risk factors for coronary artery disease like diabetes or dyslipidemia have been, pre have been presenting to us with acute coronary syndrome. So we did this study on this socioeconomic class in coronary artery disease, acute coronary syndrome, and we found that these patients who belong to low socioeconomic class, who were younger in age, who were low in their body weight and BMI, still they suffered from acute coronary syndrome, and this was attributable to high prevalence of high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is an indirect marker of inflammation in the blood. So these these people, these patients who had uh, absence of conventional risk factors, low socioeconomic class, yet presented with acute coronary syndrome, had undulating uh, inflammation in their blood vessels, and the only traditional risk factors that could be attributed to them was smoking. So smoking maybe is causing a low-grade inflammation in the body, and is causing uh, uh, inflammation of the vessels and acute coronary syndrome in the otherwise low-risk patient population. Next slide, please. 
So secondhand smoke is also dangerous. Secondhand smoke um, is something which we have to focus our attention to. It is uh, it is very effectively related to sudden infant death syndrome when uh, you know a pregnant lady is exposed to secondhand smoke. It is it is related to asthma. It is related to middle ear disease, coronary heart disease, lung cancer, and so on and so forth. Now there's something also called as a third hand smoke. Next slide, please. In which you know those. So it refers to the residual of tobacco and tobacco byproducts that solidify and forms carpet and forms sediments on carpets and drapes and in surface of the room where smoking has occurred. So we have to focus on the second hand. We have to focus on not only the public um, ban on public smoking, but indoor smoking also in private spaces leads to second hand and third hand smoke. So we have to protect uh, vulnerable individuals from both second and third hand smoke. Next slide, please. So this is the 2014, um, uh, you know, Surgeon General's report. It mentions very clearly the reduction in smoking prevalence over the last 50 years, uh, from about half in U.S. men and one third of U.S. women, to nowadays, which is around 20 percent and 15 percent in males and females, respectively. This is one of the major risk factors contributing to the decline of cardiovascular diseases um, in the United States. So in the United States, cardiovascular diseases overall incidence is decreasing uh, gradually from 1950s to the 2010s. And two major contributing factors for, for, for that decline is a decrease in consumption of tobacco and a much better control of hypertension. Next slide, please. So quitting helps. Within 20 minutes, your heart rate and your blood pressure falls down. Within 12 hours, your carbon monoxide level comes to normal. Within one to nine months, your cuffness, shortness of breath improves. Within one year, your risk of coronary heart disease is off, is about half that of a smoker. And if you quit smoking to 10 to 15 years, then you gradually come back to the level of risk of non-smoker of cardiovascular diseases per se. You, of course, remain a little higher risk for malignancies. So the WHO goal, next slide please, the WHO goal for 2025 is a 30% reduction of smoking in each country and if we are able to achieve that, we will have around 173 million fewer smokers that would prevent around 38 million premature deaths from smoking and it would save around $17 trillion from, um, from diseases and uh, from more productive life. So this is, I believe, the next slide. This is uh, probably my last slide, and I think this is more pertinent to today's uh, webinar because we have a variety of um, attendees. I think the wheel of tobacco regulation has to go from, if you focus on the 11 o'clock uh, in this particular wheel, is from growing of tobacco. Government must improve and um, governments give alternative to farmers to grow. Uh, crops which instead of tobacco which are economically viable we have to control manufacturing ban on tobacco additive ban on you know flavored tobaccos products and things like that packaging has to be you know there's uh, the uh, the risk of definitions on packaging has to be uh, has to be regulated uh, people find ways around it so it has to be regulated strictly marketing all ban on direct and indirect form of marketing including surrogate marketing has to be stopped. Taxation policies have to come into force so as to make con tobacco consumption and cigarette consumption more costly for the patients, for, for the people and the population in general. Point of purchase has to be controlled. All sign, it has to be non-off-the-counter product and we have to keep children um, out of the reach of tobacco, the young individuals. The product use policies of, you know, policy should be made that, you know, uh, in workplaces and public places and even some indoor restricted places, there is absolute ban on smoking and tobacco related products and tobacco industry uh, needs to be forced to uh, pay for all the damages it is causing both to the health as well as to the environment. There are some inspirational examples from the countries that have achieved, you know, a complete smoke-free um, workplace and the other countries who have not yet reached there should follow their example. I thank you for your kind attention and thank you for the invite for this webinar. Thank you, Shubhaji. Thanks, Professor Sethi, for once again drawing attention to some of the serious health hazards of tobacco use. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ram Saroop. Ashok Ram Saroop is a widely acclaimed, award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was the senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. 
Warm greetings from the port city of Durban, South Africa, and our Citizen News Service Editor, Bobby Ramakant, and Managing Editor, Shoba Shukla. Tobacco industry interference in public health is here too. Let me share an example. A transnational tobacco company had sued the Health Minister of South Africa in recent years, claiming that the Tobacco Products Control Act was unconstitutional. British American Tobacco claimed that the act, which prohibits the advertising or promotion of tobacco products, violated the freedom of expression by den denying them the ability to communicate one-to-one -one with adult consumers and violating the right of consumers to receive information concerning tobacco products. But the court found that the hazards of smoking far outweigh what industry was claiming. And the court noted that South Africa is a party to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and is obliged to have regard for the requirements of that treaty. The fight to protect public health from industry is an ongoing one. And we will hear more from our panelists today. We have two senior experts amongst us who have devoted their lives and energy to fighting injustices. Let me introduce our distinguished panelist, Michel Legendre, Associate Campaign Director, Corporate Accountability, and Dr. Tara Singh Bam, Deputy Regional Director, Asia Pacific, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union. Welcome to our panelists. Before we listen to our first panelist today, let me request you all to keep sending us your question, either by using the chat function or raising virtual hand of the webinar too. Keep sending the questions whilst our panelists present the program. Well, it's over to you, Michelle Legendre. Thanks so much for having me. and. Um... I apologize in advance. I'm recovering from a bit of a cold, so apologies if I start coughing. Um, as we've heard, we've we've definitely heard about the the health um, costs associated with with smoking use and with the the role of the tobacco industry in propagating and exacerbating that factor. Um, I really wanted to focus in on a few key points. One being Article 5.3 of the Global Tobacco Treaty and Article 19 and the issues that relate to it. And then I also wanted to just chime in a little bit about the precedence of the Global Tobacco Treaty and how it's having a landmark um, kind of scenario on the, the rest of the corporate accountability movement, small C, small A. Um, <clears throat> so Article 5.3 is the recognition and the, the policy point within the Global Tobacco Treaty that affirms that the the goals and the objectives of the tobacco industry is irreconcilably um, in conflict with the goals and the, the objectives of the Global Tobacco Treaty. And it makes some really um, important claims as to how governments should regulate and um, insulate the policymaking space from their relationship with tobacco industry, um, keeping them at arm's length, making sure that meetings that are happening are transparent, are accounting for um, the, the precedent of the Global Tobacco Treaty above all else, um, making sure that the policy making space at the international level doesn't allow for tobacco industry uh, representation or lobbying or influence. So the Article 5.3 is super important in terms of um, making sure that we have the foundation and the base to be able to have all these strong policy um, implementations that we're talking about. And also, uh, when we talk about making sure that people are healthy and living full and fulfilling lives, um, we don't get there if the tobacco industry is allowed to help write that policy or help have influence over that policy or to use the millions and millions of dollars and billions of dollars in profits that they accumulate each year um, to, to influence officials, to influence governments. So, a few of the things that really are of concern to corporate accountability in this moment and really highlight the importance of Article 5.3 are the ways in which the tobacco industry continues to try to assert itself as part of the solution 
in a world um, where we are hoping that um, people stop using tobacco and people use tobacco less and less every year. Um, one of the ways is through UN partnerships. So while the World Health Organization um, has made uh, stringent demands of its uh, parties of itself to, to insulate itself from the tobacco industry, um, a lot of other UN institutions continue to um, align themselves with the tobacco industry in, in different ways. Um, one of the ways is I think recently UNICEF um, was in the spotlight because of a recent expose and how their partnership with the tobacco industry undermined the, the very ways in which they were trying to um, support things like um, eliminating child labor and um, how the tobacco industry tried to use that that role in um, influencing UN uh, the UNICEF um, to really undermine the policy making that was happening elsewhere. So they used one official uh, partnership and they helped influence policy in other areas. Um, another way is most recently in Nigeria, I think um, some of our allies um, at ERA Environmental Rights Action, uh, Friends of the Earth Nigeria, uh, released a press release um, calling on UNESCO to, to end its partnership and uh, the University of Nigeria um, to end their partnership with the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World um, because they're, it's, uh, it's an official university and they're using their partnership. And the concern here is that the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World advancing uh, lower risk um, products is actually not eliminating um, tobacco use. It's, it's just finding another pathway for tobacco use to take root. And so these, these partnerships highlight the essential role that Article 5.3 plays in making sure that the policymaking space is insulated from the influence and the role that the tobacco industry plays, which is that they want to continue keeping their business and their bottom line as high as possible. They want to continue having their product at the foreground of use. And these partnerships are nothing but thinly veiled marketing um, strategies. They're nothing but thinly veiled um, points of influence in the policy making space. And I mentioned the Foundation for a Smoke Free World. Um, this is probably one of the biggest concerns because now Philip Morris has decided. Um, Phil Morris International has funded this uh, foundation for a smoke-free world, which is advancing ICOS or electronic cigarettes um, by starting with $80 million a year over the next 12 years um, to fund a foundation whose role, I guess, is to, um, to lower the usage of cigarettes. But the way that they're doing that is through uh, devices that still um, use tobacco and that still are delivering nicotine to its users um, and undermining uh, science and research and policy that is about uh, protecting people from tobacco use. Um, so the, the foundation for a smoke-free world looks like this glossy public health, um, like good uh, foundation, but at the core of it, it is still a vehicle to advance Philip Morris's intentions. And while it says that it insulates itself and is um, free from the influence of Philip Morris International, the foundation that is, um, to have eighty million dollars a year from the the foundation from Philip Morris International to this foundation is highly concerning. And the tactics that are being used to to get um, the foundation into spaces that the World Health Organization has already put out a declaration to keep this foundation at arm's length, um, shows just how closely tied the tactics that they're using are with the, the industry and how um, it's, it's of concern because they, they basically are um, another way in which the, the industry can put themselves at the forefront of the solution. And um, a couple other ways is that there's a Reuters article, if folks have not had the chance to read, that I think is really shows and highlights all the ways in which the industry continues um, to use tactics that are 
um, really sophisticated and also really harmful towards policymaking. Um, the highlights from the Reuters investigation include these secret white vans um, picking up delegates, taking them to an offsite hotel during an international negotiation on tobacco control. Um, and these are these are things that have happened in the past, and now to see them um, just within the, the last five years just shows how little um, has changed in the mind and the, the operations of the tobacco industry. If anything, they're, they're doubling down on tactics to um, undermine uh, policymaking. Um, and I think finally, one of the other ways in, in which Article 5.3 is super important to keep on pulling forward is that um, in Kenya, there was a tobacco bribery case um, that was exposed where British American tobacco was um, was called out and is currently in um, legal uh, tie up over their role in uh, basically bribing pub like thousands of public officials in Kenya to undermine policy. Uh, the last thing I wanted to, to highlight is Article 19. Um, and recently at the World Conference on Tobacco or Health, Article 19 toolkit was rolled out. And this is going to be um, an essential tool to help governments start the process of liability cases from step by step to um, the scenarios that, that are most, most applicable to them. And I think it really shows that the, the tools that are coming from the Global Tobacco Treaty, the, the ones that are um, expanding themselves into the world need to make sure to incorporate the specific scenarios that are placed upon different um, countries and different governments. Every government is different. Everyone is different, different um, dealing with a different uh, situation. And having toolkits like this that are accommodating and um, are very specific to, to the scenario that they're in are going to make sure that these liability cases that are going to pop up in the future are going to make them as strong as possible in holding the tobacco industry um, legally, financially, criminally liable in whatever way that is. Um, and just as I'm running up against time, the, the really last thing that I wanted to talk about is the precedence that the Global Tobacco Treaty provides. And this precedence, um, not to get too wispy or um, kind of... Uh, childish on this, but I think it really provides hope for the rest of the world to take on one of the largest, most abusive industries in the world that um, its entire business model is that if you use their products as directed, you will die, um, shows that you can take on Goliath, even as David's. And that precedence allows for, for hope and power in many other governments and many other spaces. And even in my work, um, getting to go to the climate negotiations this past uh, November and just a couple of months ago, um, it really was the, the moment to see that conflicts of interest, this idea of the Article 5.3, the spirit of the tobacco industry, um, accountability movement and, and corporate accountability is spreading into other spaces. And it's really important that we hold the most ideal viewpoints of the world that we want to create. And I think that that is emblematic of what Yul uh, Francisco Dorado wanted, was that we were making a better world for everyone. And it didn't just have to relate to tobacco industry accountability. It could relate to accountability of all corporations that are that are making lives shorter for people that are making lives harder or that are making lives not as happy and joy filled. So um, thank you to everyone on this call and um, I appreciate the time and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That was Michelle Legendre, Associate Campaign Director, Corporate Accountability for such an informative presentation on corporate accountability issues. This is indeed the perfect stage to invite our next panelist who has contributed to the fight against tobacco, especially in several countries in Asia specific region. Dr. Tara Singh Bam, Deputy Regional Director of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease or the Union. Dr. Tara Singh Bam was also featured prominently in the New York Times recently for how he has fought the intimidation tactics of the industry 
and helped governments advance tobacco control and promote health. Dr. Tara Singh Bam has been on the CNS webinar panel of experts several times in the past. Well, let's welcome Dr. Tara Singh Bam. It's over to you now. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this uh, very, uh, very important session. Uh, as the previous speakers has, uh, have already uh, highlighted the key, uh, the need of the tobacco control for, to save lives and uh, also to, uh, to uh, contribute uh, the economy at the family, national and international level. So the, uh, uh, I would just like to highlight some uh, the, the, the impact of the tobacco in uh, the overall the SDGs and also what is happening in some uh, the, uh, in the country and the regional level in terms of tobacco industry interference and also in terms of tobacco control progress. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we uh, we uh, we all know that we are in the era of the sustainable development goals. That's the SDG, and we all know the SDGs. Uh, they include 17 goals and 169 targets, and these are the goals and targets uh, should be achieved over next 15 years. So the the aim of the the SDGs uh, is, is to uh, end uh, the poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all as a part of the new SDGs agenda. So uh, I I can see the tobacco control uh, 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 can play a bigger role uh, to achieve these SDGs and to reduce premature death from non-communicable disease. Uh, and also to to help the the, the countries, the economy, uh, and the overall development. So to, therefore, tobacco control can play the direct and indirect relations to overall the the goals and the targets of the SDGs. So if you look at the the uh, the, the next slide, the tobacco actually the, the uh, more than the, the 200 million the uh, adult tobacco the, the users now uh, live with uh, in poverty. And the, uh, these are the uh, these are the, the smoker mainly they are in uh, the low income countries. They are mainly in Asia and Africa, and they spend more than 10 percent of their household income. Uh, to, uh, uh, on tobacco, uh, the, the, for example, in in Thailand they spend more than th the 13 percent. In Indonesia is about uh, the, the 11.5 percent. So what does it mean? Uh, it means they have less money to spend for food, to spend for their health care, to spend for their education. So moreover, uh, they, if anybody uh, the falls. They, they, they are uh, ill in, uh, because of the tobacco use in a, in a family. So that means the main, the breadwinner or the main earner, they can also, uh, they, 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 they are, uh, lost the, the family can lose the main earner uh, or breadwinner in, in the family. So there is a, always the greater the family impact and also the, the economic in, impact uh, both at the societal and the country level due to the tobacco use. Uh, if you look at the uh, the, the slide uh, in Malawi, for example, more than the 70,000 children, they are forced to work in, in tobacco uh, and also tobacco farming. So what does it mean? It means they are forced also to 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 uh, to leave the schools or they are not the, the, the encouraged to go for the school. So when we talk about the education for all and the, the, the tobacco, Industry may really manipulates the, the poor families, their children, and uh, also the, the 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 community as a whole. Uh, so we can see the, the uh, this is one of the, the very the, the critical situation that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, that may hamper the, to achieve the, the the equitable quality education for all because of the tobacco. Uh, the second hand, uh, the exposure is also major concerns for the, the for family, for, for the society, for the nations. In 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 uh, in Asia, mainly in China, Indonesia, and many other countries, the, the second hand exposure is a huge, and more the more than the uh, in Indonesia is a, about hundreds millions. The the, uh, the non smoker they are continue to uh, to expose to second hand smoke, and a similar situation in other countries. As well, so that uh, they, uh, it shows a very clear indication that tobacco 
and tobacco industry really, they are the threat to achieve uh, gender equality and empower all the women and girls. So uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the, we all we all know the, uh, the the healthy the workforce is a very critical for the healthy economy of the country or healthy economy for the families. So in many countries, due to the tobacco the use, the the, the deaths the, the, the deaths are occur the the uh, in most productive age group in very very prime productive years. Uh, such as in Pakistan and Indonesia as well. So the, uh, the because of these days, the the the, the uh, and the, the the family and the uh, uh, family they are really suffered with the with the the uh, uh, we, with the the uh, I mean the economic and also as well as the health and other other the development issues. Uh, so we really need to think how to tackle the tobacco and tobacco industry in this case. Tobacco industry not to, uh, not only pose the threat to health and development, but also they are really the, the, the threat to the climate, uh, the, the issue as well. They are, yeah, uh, for example, the tobacco, the manufacturer, they produce over 2 million tons of solid waste. It this shows clearly that tobacco industry perpetuates the climate change as well. Therefore, tobacco really challenge it's a challenge for the decent work and economic growth and also the climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So the tobacco kills the more than 7 million people each year. And we know the tobacco industry makes billions of dollars profit by selling death and disease. And this is not acceptable for all of us. And tobacco is a, a epidemic is growing in in developing countries, particularly in Asia and Africa. Uh, the uh, smoking prevalence is increasing both male, both in males and females. In Asia Pacific countries such as in Indonesia, China and India, hold large number of smokers. The figures are growing each year. This is happening because of tobacco industry wrongful behavior. This is happening because of very weak legislation and policies in place in these countries. So the, uh, the, the great concern is if we don't act now with effective intervention, it is unlikely to achieve 2025 global tar targets, a 30% relative reduction in prevalence of current tobacco use uh, in person above 15 years. So this is uh, some serious concern that we all have to they, they, uh, they consider. Uh, next slide, please. For a decade, we all know the, the next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, for a decade, we all know tobacco industry uh, has been doing wrongful, deceptive, and criminal behaviors. They work with their front group. Uh, next slide, please. Their business community, they, are, they place their, their, their market, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they place the killer product in, in, a, in, a, in a very low income, the, the community, by mobilizing the different groups. They can be the academician, they can be the, the, uh, uh, the legal expert, they can be the media, they can be any politicians or government officials or any, uh, any, any civil society worker as well. So they are, the industry can play the, the manipulate the different segments of our community. So we have to be really very strategic. How to how to really prevent these the tobacco industries the wrongful doing? How can we make them more accountable? Uh, how can we make them more liable by uh, by introducing uh, strong uh, rules and regulation at the country level or at the subnational level? Uh, in tobacco industry, next please. To, uh, next, please. Uh, tobacco industry. How the tobacco industry sees the particular in the the Asia, especially the the Indonesia. Uh, they see the Indonesia as a, their fertile market, and they mention in their website is very clearly they say Indonesia is a recognized tobacco friendly market with no smoking bans or other restriction compared to other Asian countries. What does it mean? They see. Indonesia uh, is, it has it's a huge the population, and the big uh, the, the the most productive uh, the youth populations are there. So they 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 are targeting youth and children in Indonesia, similarly in other country in Asia Pacific region as well. 
So the, the industry's criminal uh, activity includes always targeting the children and also the youth and women. Uh, so-called they, they, they promote their, 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 their products with a light or mild cigarettes or they, they also add the candy, fruits, flavors to the tobacco products and also targeting the, 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 uh, the, the aggressive campaign uh, to, to the children and the youth by mobilizing the movie stars and so on. Uh, next slide please. Uh, in Indonesia, the tobacco farmers, the next slide please, the tobacco farmers are the victim. I would say they are the victim. They are manipulated by the tobacco industries and they, they, they always use the tobacco farmers for their own vested interest. For example, they, in Indonesia, the, the, the industry have used the farmers to protest against the tobacco control and FCTC assertion. So the, uh, uh, it's not only it's not a fault of the tobacco farmers because tobacco farmers needs the support from the governments to shift their the the farming in other the uh, the, the agriculture product or other business area and they are willing to but the industries always always manipulates them to uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, not to do the uh, the such things so it's it's uh, something uh, the uh, we all have to think and come up with the, yeah, the, uh, the, our strategy to help the tobacco farmers and the, uh, uh, stop the tobacco industry behavior, whatever they are doing with the tobacco farmers. Uh, next slide, please. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the industry used the politician. Similarly, they also used the member of parliaments in Indonesia to, uh, to, to undermine the tobacco control efforts and to uh, block the tobacco control policy development at the parliaments and also uh, within the government sector. And the industry also used the, uh, so many the academicians and the, government, the, the universities to uh, discredit or to under, undermine the, the science, uh, the uh, say, uh, uh, science. So they have the, the, the different tactics and the strategy to block uh, to undermine the tobacco control efforts. So I must say here, we must make the tobacco, uh, the industry accountable because they are responsible uh, to kill the 7 million people every year. And they should not be exempt from, the, from any justice and from any responsibility. So next slide, please. Uh, Despite the, the tobacco industry, next slide, uh, the, uh, uh, the wrongful behavior uh, at the sub-national level, at the national level, at the international level, we are making a good progress. We have now 180 countries joined the WHO FCTC. So they are, they, uh, as, a, as a global level, we have the 180 governments together fighting for tobacco and fighting for the, addressing the non-communicable disease. And also we have several uh, the international organizations uh, working together uh, to support the countries, governments, civil societies, uh, the universities, and uh, the people at the country level. So one of them is Bloomberg Philanthropy. Uh, I can say here the Bloomberg Philanthropy has made a very critical role uh, in, uh, in accelerating the tobacco control at the global levels, engaging the governments, engaging the civil societies, engaging the, uh, the pol uh, sub-national politicians, engaging the, the universities. So they, uh, the, uh, the Bloomberg, the initiative uh, the, to reduce tobacco use has played a really bigger role uh, in the last uh, the, the one decade. And they are, uh, they are supporting us, uh, uh, the, the countries, uh, to further advance the tobacco control. We can see the uh, significant achievement has been made and the, in, in, uh, the, uh, it is estimated uh, about 35 million uh, lives saved due to the, the strong tobacco control the efforts uh, uh, the, in, in the last one decade. So the, uh, I can say that there are several countries implementing the larger graphic health warnings. Uh, next slide, please. And countries uh, from Asia Pacific like uh, Nepal, uh, the uh, India, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and they are making really good progress on uh, implementing larger graphic health warnings. And they uh, they have found these uh, the, the measures are effective. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the uh, the as I mentioned, the, the Nepal has been implementing the larger graphic health warnings. 
uh, they, and they found it's very effective and it is one of the effective tools to educate the people at the community levels. And the interesting th thing is always tobacco industry, they, they claim that the retailers the, doesn't support the, 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 the tobacco control. But uh, the, in contrast, in Nepal, we found that uh, the, more than 90% of the retailers really support the, the larger graphic health warning uh, uh, in Nepal. So the, the retailers, they don't have any concern about the, their business, but they, they are also very uh, they are supportive for the government rules, regulation, and health of the people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, despite, as I mentioned earlier, the Indonesia is a bit uh, the, the challenging uh, the, in terms of tobacco control, but there are many opportunities. And the, uh, the, the country is making really good progress at the sub-national level. The, the mayor from Bogor City has banned the, the, the tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship, and also uh, the, the, he has banned the, the display at the point of sale, uh, the, including the, 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 the tobacco advertising as well. So this, is, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this indicates there is a will at the subnational level. There are many champions at the subnational level. We need to engage those political champions to advance the tobacco control at the subnational level in Indonesia. Very similar situation in other countries as well. Uh, next slide, please. So with this success, the, uh, Indonesia has implementing uh, a smoke-free initiative to more than 200 cities and districts with strong support of the Indonesian Mayor Alliance. So this is also, the, uh, these all mayors, they are, uh, they are together to fight for the tobacco industry interference, to, to block the tobacco industries, and they have made the declaration uh, they, to stop the tobacco industry interference. They have requested national governments to come up with a strong regulation to ban tobacco industry interference and their lobbying as well. So what we need, we need the really political commitments and political partnership to, uh, to prevent the tobacco industry, uh, the, uh, the interference and their tactics. Uh, one of the, the next slide please, one of the successful example that the, the, uh, we as a, as a regional team, we are, and also Indonesia has, uh, has a, uh, achieved, that is ban the, the inter-tobac, is uh, one of the biggest uh, tobacco here, that was planned by Dharman Tobacco uh, Company in 2014 in Bali. Uh, the, uh, the, this company has already received the uh, uh, approval from the Ministry of Trade, National Ministry of Trade, uh, Indonesia. What, what happened, the governor of Bali, he, he, he completely uh, the banned this, he didn't uh, give the permission to, uh, to do this in the Bali, and the, the, there was a really great uh, the, the, uh, the civil society, the movements, and the university's engagement uh, to support the governor of Bali's the, the, the initiative to ban this uh, the, uh, the inter tobacco uh, uh, trade fair. So this was, uh, the, the industry was really targeting more than three thousands, the, the, the participants and the exhibitors in, in Bali in 2014. But what does it mean? It gives really very good meaning to us. If we work together, if we engage the leaders, uh, if we uh, uh, they engage the media and the different the stakeholders, we can definitely they, they, they make the tobacco industry accountable and we can definitely uh, they, they, they eliminate the tobacco industry and the tobacco uh, uh, from our community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just, a few, just a few slides. Uh, the, uh, we need to really foster in partnerships. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, through the unions, uh, one of the key role uh, working with the governments, civil society, and academicians. Our key role is to gain the political partnership and commitment uh, the, uh, from the governments, from the politicians. Uh, for tobacco control and NCD prevention program in Asia Pacific regions. So as a result, uh, the, we have established Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCD prevention. Currently, it's, it's being uh, joined by 23 mayors uh, from 10 countries, and the similar but the country level alliance uh, also have been established in Indonesia, Cambodia, and Vietnam. We are also in progress to establish in Myanmar. Nepal and in other countries in the regions. So why we need this? We need really political commitments, partnership, uh, to, and also the, we need the implementer at the, at the community and sub-national levels. The mayors and the district head, the governors, they are the key to uh, key frontliner uh, 
uh, within the political system to implement the, the things effectively. So they are, in terms of magnitude of preventable harm, uh, we can say no other industry comes close to the tobacco industry. The human toll resulting from the tobacco industry uh, is awful behavior, behavior is immeasurable. So we cannot, uh, we cannot just uh, the, the leave the tobacco industry as it is. We have to, we must make them accountable and liable. So governments uh, uh, and also civil society, we all have to come together. Next slide, please. Uh, they all have to come together for a strong legislation and a plan of action with targets. So one, one thing that is missing currently in most, in most of the countries, so there is a plan, there is a legislation, but the, the lack is the implementation and the lack is the, the action plan with targets. So the, there is a the strong need, if we really uh, want to eradicate or eliminate tobacco, we have to make also governments accountable to implement their legislation and the policies. And the government, uh, the, every government must come up with a clear targets uh, and the strategy as well. So the, the, I would, uh, yeah, as previous speaker the, the suggested something, I would strongly recommend we really need to uh, the, 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 uh, make the governments, uh, the, the more uh, the uh, government's investment for the best intervention. Uh, the government investment should go to the uh, uh, should go to the uh, the effective the the evidence based uh, the the measures they are currently that we have raising tax and prices on tobacco products i would also add here including other junk food junk drinks and alcohol as well and the larger graphic health warnings uh, with uh, the the plain packaging should be introduced in uh, by all the governments uh, that there should be complete ban of tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship, including the, the, uh, the ban of misleading information such as uh, low tar, light, or the misleading the information, uh, uh, other misleading information as well. So uh, the, uh, the countries and the, the government must uh, implement the comprehensive uh, smoke-free policies in all public places and poor places, and public education through mass media, and also resource whatever the available within the countries should be used to, to enhance the public uh, education at the community and also at the national level. So the, we must really ban the tobacco industry interference with the strong regulations and the, the, this regulation should be really implemented uh, both within the government sector and beyond the government sectors. Uh, I would say the, the, uh, this is not uh, the last but uh, also not the least the fostering political commitments. We need the political commitments. And also at the same time, partnership is also critical. So we can see that there are many international forums, just uh, as Soba has mentioned earlier, there we had uh, recently, there was a World Health Assembly, just uh, the, the, the health in, in Geneva, and the, all the health ministers and the health leaders, they, are, they, have, they have made the commitment of uh, the health health is first and that they have made the, the political commitment is critical for especially for NCDs and also tobacco control and there will be the UN high level meeting for TB and uh, the NCDs and those are the critical of uh, the, uh, the opportunities for the, the, the for all of us to make the uh, the uh, tobacco control and NCD on the top of the agenda and there is also need uh, the for strong collaboration and the integration within the, the, the health program such as TB, NCDs and tobacco control uh, as well as the reproductive health programs. The, all these health programs should work together with strong political leaderships and partnership uh, as well as the media, civil society engagement. We would definitely make a tobacco industry liable and we can definitely uh, the, in the tobacco from our community. With this, I would like to thanks to all of you. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was Tara Singh Bam, Deputy Regional Director, Asia Pacific International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union, for sharing such an inspirational insights on tobacco control and human rights. Well, that brings us to the end of our experts presentation. Now let us begin the open session. Participants, please
Keep sending your questions using chat functions or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. It's now over to our Citizen News Service Managing Editor, Shova, Madam. Well, open session begins now. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, participants, as Ashok ji suggested, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raising your virtual hand on the webinar screen. We already have a lot many questions which have come in. Uh, Govind Kumar Tripathi, Technical Officer at the India Office of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, wants to ask a question. Govind, would you like to ask the question yourself? If you're there uh, online. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Suva? Yes, very clearly. Yes. Okay. Okay. So very nice discussion. Uh, all the panel members uh, um, have uh, made good discussion. I first of all, I congratulate to everyone that they have covered the area very in descriptive manner. So that's a good understanding. But I, on the other hand, I would suggest to give more time to the panel discussion rather than so that the, the people who are like uh, just uh, having more questions, they can get more time. Um, my question was basically regarding to the, the divestment. By in Indian context, if you see the company which is LIC, I just give you the example because this is the uh, uh, information which is in open market that they have almost around 25% uh, uh, investment in that tobacco company. So if the government one side, if they are having a controlling mechanism, another side they are having, you know, the investment in the companies and some other companies also having the same sort of uh, thing in the company. So how can these mechanisms uh, develop so the divestment uh, process can be initiated in that way? I wanted to know the, you know, uh, some advices or some sort of suggestions in light of SDGs from the panel. I think My both of our yes, I think both of our panelists could uh, give their inputs for this. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Bang, uh, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, for your the, uh, the questions. Yes, the, we know that there is uh, in there are many countries uh, they have investment uh, in tobacco industry. And also, they they are also doing the tobacco control as well. So they, uh, it's a, it's 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 like a conflict of interest. But they, uh, we have to understand that tobacco is also is a killer, is a legal killer, but is a is a, is a, is a sinful pro product. So it's a time now we all uh, the the civil societies, professional organizations, and also the the global community, including the WHO. Now they all are they have recognized tobacco should be eradicated, should be eliminated. So we need to really build the political commitment and political partnership. That's why I have used the word, not only political commitment, there should be political partnership to change this scenario. So the, for example, in Nepal, uh, I'm from Nepal, in my country, still the, the governments own the tobacco industry. But uh, the, as a, the, we have frequently built the, the awareness uh, the the, uh, the among the politicians and the, the government officials this is not fair this is not fair tobacco is killer tobacco should be isolated tobacco should be eradicated tobacco should be eliminated so government has made a decision that they will slowly the, in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a five years period they will close the tobacco industry they will help the tobacco farmer to shift their business to other area so there are many other strategies that government has to come a government cannot just you know they, they stop the things overnight but the government has to come up with a plan with a strong the the, the plan that can help the tobacco the farmers to switch the tobacco, the, the tobacco farming in other agriculture products, and also the government has to the, the come up with some strategy uh, to uh, 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 for helping the the people who are associated with the uh, the, the yeah, under the tobacco industry. I mean, with the tobacco industry, maybe the the, the employment issues, uh, uh, maybe there are some the retailer issues. But what we have seen in Nepal, the retailers are not uh, not you know impacted with any the tobacco, uh, the controls. They are they support tobacco. So again, my my request, all of us, is it's a, it's a very very, very uh, the difficult and challenging question that you have asked. But again, we need to build the really political commitment and partnerships, and it can happen. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Would you like to add something to that? Um. I think Dr. Bam covered a lot of it. I think the, just to underscore, I think that 
one of the most essential ways in which we're going to shift the tide is through um, a really clear understanding and open pathways of communication of what are the issues that countries are facing in eliminating um, these partnerships or these uh, investments in the tobacco industry and how can we move them to to eliminate those types of uh, relationships because the reality is is you're right if there's that investment on one side from governments um that is a conflict of interest but there are also a whole host of ways in which governments are trying to shift entire economies away from tobacco um like Dr. Bam is talking about, <clears throat> we need to have a justice-oriented focus for the the people that are the victims of this industry. And that includes farmers, that includes smokers, that includes um, the the way in which that it's, it's made itself profitable. Um, and if that means talking with governments about how they can shift their investments away from tobacco into somewhere else, then those have to be conversations. And I think that that is a really valid point is that we don't get there without creating really strong partnerships. So um, yeah, everything that Dr. Bam said and just underscoring those pieces. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Upendra Bhujani, who as we all know is a noted leader in tobacco control as well as prioritizes corporate accountability in advancing public health. Uh, Upendra, would you like to ask your question yourself? If you're um, there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, Shoba. Um, it was wonderful to hear from both the speaker. And what is clear from their speech is that we have to put in place necessary policies and actions, uh, more importantly at local level, uh, to prevent tobacco industry interference. What I'm more interested in hearing from them or learning from them is that um, you know, doing all these, what we are talking now is really we are talking about protective measures. We are trying to protect public policies, um, but we are really not doing much to make industry liable uh, as we have uh, these words in the title of this webinar. So, for example, in India, um, there have been some uh, attempts uh, to actually make tobacco industry and tobacco trade uh, illegitimate. For example, there have been uh, ongoing efforts to sort of classify nicotine uh, as a poison, um, or for example, to classify tobacco trade itself um, as uh, something uh, which is uh, not um, a routine commerce, and so taking away the legal right to trade uh, from tobacco industry. Uh, and unless we move in that direction, we are not really doing justice to um, to a, a huge uh, scientific evidence, which is very very clear, uh, which clearly establishes that the tobacco is a lethal uh, product, right? So I, I was wondering whether there are what are their comments on these, and whether there are actually any precedents uh, globally uh, in this direction. Uh, thank you, uh, Michelle. Would you like to answer that question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, without liability measures, there there is no effectiveness because then what happens is that the tobacco industry can pivot and move into a different realm as we're seeing right now with um, e-cigarettes. So I think that the Article 19 toolkit that was released in partnership with the Secretariat is a really great starting place because it has a lot of information on how to build a liability case. And while um, these legal cases take a long time, they take a lot of resources. The outcome is that you shift um, the, the ability for the tobacco industry to operate with impunity, um, which is what's happening right now, is that to most extents, um, the tobacco industry has gone on the offensive, has taken different countries to court, not even to win, just to run course for a really long time. We saw it with Uruguay, we saw it with um, we saw it with Australia, and we will probably continue to see it unless other countries take up the mantle that have the resources or the willpower, uh, the political will to to advance these types of liability cases um, because the tobacco industry feels that it can continue to do these things and go um, unchallenged. So I think, yes, we, we need more liability cases. And I think some of the ways that you're describing would be um, more how in-country 
countries can take take those measures and and reclassify tobacco products or reclassify different things. I think one of the things that I'm thinking about is with e-cigarettes. Um, they're still nicotine delivery devices. They still are using tobacco product, and the tobacco industry is trying to say that it's less harmful or that it's um, the the problem with 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 tobacco is when they're put in cigarettes and they're burned, and that is just that's just not right to to be able to to talk about their product like that it's tobacco is the problem and nicotine is one of those addictive chemical measures that causes um, a lot of issues in people's ability to stop using it so um yes to all and hopefully that that's a good explanation uh thank you uh, arun dan has a question uh he wants to know uh, if there have been any studies about the efficacy of pictorial warnings on cigarette packs and also he wants to know if there is any country in the world which has declared which has declared tobacco use as illegal uh, uh, dr baum would you like to say something about pictorial warnings you are passionate about that and have done a lot of work uh, in that field yeah regarding the pictorial health warning we have the uh, enough evidence uh, from many uh, the countries especially from our the region as well from asia pacific uh, the uh, countries like uh, we have done the uh, the effectiveness the the uh, the study in indonesia and we found the uh, it's, a, it's a very effective more, the, more than 90 uh, percent of the people have seen the pictorial health warnings and they are worried about this and uh, also we did in in uh, uh, in myanmar and the if you compare with the text and pictorial health warnings people were more scared with the pictorial health warning and the uh, the smoker they tried to more than 57 percent of the smoker they tried to quit uh, the smoking because of the pictorial health warning in myanmar and very similar finding also in uh, in cambodia uh, uh, and also in nepal of course it's a great uh, the, uh, the the finding from nepal the more than 55 percent of the smoker they reduced the the number of cigarettes they used to uh, smoke before pictorial health warning that is from 11 to 5 cigarettes per day that means a 55 more than 55 percent reduction of the number of cigarettes they used to smoke uh, in before and after so they, they it's a great uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the measures to to educate the public and we have the evidence also uh, uh, actually from the India as well there was uh, some study uh, uh, done and they they, uh, they found that they, they just, uh, there was some uh, remarkable decline uh, of the uh, 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 regarding the again the uh, the number of cigarettes they used before and after the uh, the pictorial health warnings and the uh, in Australia there was also great uh, the, uh, because of the plain packaging the uh, the significant reduction of smoking prevalence among the youth so it's a uh, uh, so we can see from the, uh, the different parts of the world, the pictorial health warnings are effective among the, the people, especially among the uh, low socioeconomic status. Uh, the, so they are effective. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question from Marsi Annapurani, director. Uh, she has sent the question. So the question is what has to be done to enact FCTC in reality in countries? Who has to push the agenda? Because tobacco impacts tuberculosis also, and is one of the risk factors for tuberculosis. Who needs to push the agenda? Uh, uh, Michelle, okay. would you like to? Would you mind to repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, what has to be done effectively to enact FCTC in reality in the countries? Who needs to push the agenda? Uh -huh. So it's a very yeah so i, I think the uh, uh, the 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 participant who asked this question from the tb community so we know the tb tuberculosis uh, the uh, uh, smoking or tobacco use uh, use is one of the major risk factor you know for the to advance the tb disease and also to make the tb the treatments failure we know this so in this context uh, who has to push the FCTC effective implementation at the country level? If it's we, we all the TB community, 
we all the tobacco control community, we all the public health community, we have to really push the government for effective implementation of the tobacco control within any health sector, whether it's a TB control program, whether it's a, the reproductive health program, whether it's a child health program, whether it's a universal health coverage, whether it's in any program, the, we all have to push for the effective implementation of the FCTC. And it can be implemented in any settings. We have a great example from India, from China, from Bangladesh, from uh, Indonesia. The TB control program, they, they integrate the uh, smoking cessation and also the, uh, some uh, the, uh, uh, awareness program within the, uh, the TB control program. And the TB patient in all countries, more than 70% of the tuberculosis patients who used to smoke, they, they quitted uh, smoking su successfully after six months. And they, uh, they haven't, they not only quit the smoking, but they build a really good public awareness uh, in the family and in the community about the danger of the smoking and the danger of TB and smoking. Okay, thank you. There is another question regarding FCTC. Uh, Zafar Kidwai of STAR in Bangladesh wants to know uh, when Article 19 of FCTC is about liability of tobacco company, uh, FCTC was adopted in 2003. Why is Article 19 not implemented in my country and many other countries as well? Why is there so much of a delay? Both of you should something on that yeah i can i can speak more to the yes. the legal aspect yes. of that i think article 19 yes. was was created with a, a lot of ideals in it um in terms of implementation one of the major hurdles was that so many there's so many different countries and so many government mechanisms and so many legal mechanisms that it wasn't it was thrown out there and then um there wasn't a real clear path forward for many countries um, and so now, hopefully, with the, the toolkit, that alleviates one of the concerns. And then from there, it's on um, countries and civil society and the, sec the World Health Organization to really start working towards um, picking up the, the legal cases and moving them forward and making them as strong as possible, too. Um, I think one of the things that we run into is if these cases aren't strong, um, especially the early ones, then we can't set the strong precedents that we need to have for um, victories for the future. So when there's other cases that come up, they can't reference the case in Bangladesh that happened because um, that one was lost and there was a significant piece of information that a judge might have carried through there. So I think that that's another thing is that the early cases have to be very strong so that later cases can depend on them for um, for really strong cases uh, to, to keep on coming through, so. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Baum, do you want to yes, say that's something? Yes, right. I would like to add something. Yes, uh, I, I fully agree with uh, the Michelle. And also, yeah, it depends on the country. You know, the, the FCTC is, is a package, uh, package of the many the interventions uh, there. So the uh, first, uh, depending on the country, we have to prioritize the, the intervention first. So the in most of the countries, like uh, in Asia, in, in also in Africa, so the uh, demand reduction strategy now is the priority on list. So they, they are like uh, the tax, raising tobacco tax, uh, graphic health warning, the smoke free, ban uh, the all types of tobacco advertising, uh, the mass media campaign, the smoking cessation program. These are also not well implemented. And these are very powerful the intervention to reduce the demand to educate the people and to uh, the, uh, to contribute uh, to, uh, to overall uh, to reduction of the overall uh, smoking prevalence. So these powerful interventions haven't been implemented well in many countries, including Bangladesh as well. So uh, uh, so the, that's why the uh, these are the also most cost effective intervention. Government doesn't need to invest a lot of money, and government doesn't need to have the very legal, very strong legal uh, the team. And uh, so uh, that's why the now the priority first to implement this intervention and then uh, you know, gradually implement other provision of the FCTC as well. And thank you. 
uh, there are too many questions still streaming in, uh, but we have already overshot the time by 15 minutes. Uh, so I think uh, we will not take in any more questions. We will share the email IDs of our panelists with the participants, and then they can directly ask them the questions via email. Uh, Dr. P. S. Sarma wants to add his comment uh, that this has been a very uh, informative webinar. He says political commitment, health education about bad effects and side effects of tobacco use is very essential. If there is no buyer, who will produce tobacco? Rightly said. We now come to the close of today's webinar. My sincere thanks to all our panelists for enriching us with their expert presentations on how holding the tobacco industry liable will be a game changer for health and development and further our cause for a tobacco free world. We are grateful to the participants for their patient listening and, and engagement with the webinar. And last but not the least, thanks to Ashok Ramsarup for moderating the webinar so well. As always, the webinar gets streamed on YouTube and podcast links will be shared with you all and will be available in the public domain soon after. Lest we forget, World No Tobacco Day is on 31st of May. That is the day after tomorrow. Let us all resolve to work together for a smokeless, tobaccoless society through implementation of the WHO FCTC in letter and spirit. Bye and have a good day. All right. Thank you, Shubha. Thank you very much. Thank you.